So in this case, so the work that we did, we built a very simple video game of Pong, which itself has order and structure to it, right? You know, they're very, in, in the game of the one that we built, which is a single player breakout style, the only two rules, right? If you were to program it, which is have a ball, a ball will start with a random trajectory and it will continue on that vector trajectory until it hits either a hello hello everyone welcome to the it's material world podcast i'm your co-host panith i'm with david today and i think this might be our latest recording that we've we've ever done um correct me if i'm wrong but here it's it's almost 11 p.m right now in, in minnesota and that's because we interviewed a old friend of ours han um who is in melbourne australia right now so it's you know about 3 p.m his time so um it was a really cool episode where we talked about you know training neurons to play the 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 video game Pong. Um, and we really dive into the science behind it and exactly how it works from like the, the quote unquote artificial intelligence perspective. So just wanted to hear your favorite part, David, before we dive right in. Yeah, no, it's a great time. We met him in uh, Barcelona and we really enjoyed his talk there. Uh, so probably my favorite thing was, of course, talking about the neurons playing Pong and he basically sets it up as they grow neurons atop of the silicon chip and just uh, feed in signals, whether it be ordered or disordered. And it's interesting to see his rationale behind how can we take this like random subset of neurons and get them to do something more um, and actually show intelligence, which they have been able to do. So I really enjoyed that. And then also he talks at the end of the episode about how MSCs can play into this space specifically and what we can add and I think he makes a really great point of, you can find this technology very cool, but there's other technologies that need to grow adjacent to it. And so just because you find this cool, but not your like forte, there's still other areas to grow where they don't have core competencies and they will need to uh, collaborate with others. And so I think it just shows the very collaborative nature needed to make huge breakthroughs in science like they're trying to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And I thought it was really cool hearing kind of the, the context of this technology, right? Like it's cool enough that you can train brain cells to play Pong, but, you know, how do we make an impact in the real world now and down the line? And he goes into the potential like personalized medicine applications, you know, the potential to kind of be a substitute for animal testing, right? As you, you can instead, you know, provide treatments to these, these neurons, right. Or these stem cells, um, or you can create like dementia models. That was kind of one of the potential applications that he mentioned. So it's really cool. You know, I have that healthcare background, so it was particularly fascinating for me, but we really just dive into this frontier that, you know, this brain in a jar type technology and that intersection between artificial intelligence and biological intelligence. And so really cool perspective for this material science podcast. Did you have anything else you wanted to add before you jump in? No, I'm excited to jump in. All right, let's get into it. All right. Hello, everyone. For today's episode, we are very excited to welcome Han Wang Chung, the current CEO and founder of Cortical Labs. After completing his medical training at John Hopkins and the University of Melbourne, he has founded several startups that focus on creating smartphone-based apps for personalized healthcare. At Cortical Labs, he, focus, he currently focuses on bridging the gap between artificial intelligence and biological intelligence. Thank you so much for joining us today, Han. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, and we've actually met before, like in person in Barcelona at Puzzle X. So we were super yep. excited about your technology and, and we'll get into that in more detail. Um, but I remember, you know, your presentation really stole the show. And so we just wanted to dive into that a little bit. Um, and I know that, you know, Cortical Labs, at least the website mentions, focusing on achieving biological computer chips, sometimes referred to as a brain in a jar, right? Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you could dive into that in a little bit more detail, kind of the overarching goal of Cortical Labs and how this all started. Yeah, absolutely. At the end of the day, we're all trying to build what's known as strong artificial intelligence or artificial generalized intelligence, which is essentially systems that have the ability to learn through experience with 
a limited amount of data, right? So, uh, you know, the current explosion in in applications in, in the artificial intelligence space, you know, has is nothing short of, of, of amazing, right? But I think it's also important to, to understand how we've come to this point, which is <clears throat> the development of, of artificial neural network, deep learning, back propagation, now attention and transformers and large language models. All of these things are, I guess, a way of this, you know, uh, classifying, understanding um, information or data. And uh, in, in, in intelligence really is it's a way of actually segmenting and making decisions based on that. The way we do it, however, is very energy efficient, inefficient, and also very data inefficient. So, for instance, you know, um, what is it? The, the hot, the hottest thing right now is Chat GPT or you know GPT three three point five. Yep. Those systems literally have are so good because they've ingested everything on the internet. Literally anything that's publicly available has been fed into that neural network. And yeah, this is the product of this. Now, the thing about it to realize is that, you know, um, that a requires a, a crazy amount of data. Uh, and secondly, the amount of data, uh, energy to train it, I think uh, they were saying it was probably the energy budget of of Copenhagen or something like that. Just oh to gosh. train, yeah, uh, GPT, GPT three. I don't know about Chat GPT, but I guess it's mostly the same backend. So, um, and also to to run it costs an ungod- ungodly amount of energy. So the way you can think about it is that yes, you know these things are p- producing interesting responses, and um, you know the the artificial intelligence is, is working very much to say a plane flies, but it doesn't flap its wings like a bird, right? Um, and I think um, you know, a lot of the times machine learning people will say, well, you know, well, we don't we don't make a plane look like a bird when it flies, yet it still flies and it carries a ton of people and, you know, is, is able to go at, you know, uh, what is it, uh, almost sub supersonic speeds. But there is a caveat involved with that, which is the only reason why the planes are able to fly like this is because of the fact that we have discovered a source of energy extremely dense that is readily available and that's the case of fossil fuels right now in nature you can only really expand well you should be expanding less than what you consume in terms of energy and so at the end of the day in the natural world the scarcest resource available is energy or or calories in this case right so you know if we take a few steps back and we say why do we why do we choose to tr- go down this path of trying to understand how to build intelligence using biology and that's you know the reason for that which is can we build intelligence that doesn't require that much amount of energy to operate and, and achieve relatively the same amount of performance using you know uh, the same building blocks that you have in say organisms like you and I a dog or a cat so that's, I guess, if you, you know, the, the overarching goal behind this, the way we think about it is that, for instance, a human, right? So you and I, we're pretty much the only, well, I guess there are also some organisms now like crows and dolphins and so forth, where there is evidence of generalizable intelligence, i.e. We, ha- we exhibit things like meta learning, the ability to learn to learn, the ability to online learn. So we're continuously learning and, and changing our model of the world and no no artificial system has done that yet so if you if you take that and you say well you and i we all have a brain a cat also has a brain a dog has a brain what is a brain made from they're made from little organoids that are made from networks that are made from neuron somewhere in that spectrum you have all the amazing things that make us who we are emerge right the question is at what point in this level of complexity do you start getting these uh, phenomena such as intelligence, you know, consciousness, and so forth, and I think you know that's that's one of the most exciting questions for us. Going back to so, sort of the lower levels, right? Not to the level of a single neuron, because we've we've done experiments with that, and they don't particularly do anything too interesting. But then starting to say, well, okay, now that we have that, what is it going to look like if we have networks of those things? So, um, yeah, I guess it's a bit of a long-winded way of saying, you know, why we're doing this and, and, and the rationale for that. Well, that's a great story. And I think one thing that maybe we can talk about a little later is what actually is artificial intelligence? And I guess one way that you put it is that we're just looking for patterns and what's the most efficient way to look for patterns. So I guess this kind of goes into the next question is mm. the way that you're making a brain in a jar is by growing these neurons across a silicon chip, which means, yep. which is a means of completing the circuit. How can 
neurons first grow across silicon and the material challenges behind that, but how can that subsystem that grows naturally think for itself and start to recognize these patterns? Yeah, so I think there are, so there's two questions there, which is firstly, how do we grow these these neurons on on the silicon um, surface? And um, so we do use a a compound called laminin, uh, which helps adhere the neurons onto the surface. It's also using glass slides, so it, you know there's nothing harmful, and that that's what the you know keeps the neurons somewhat attached to the surface. They will actually pick up themselves and move to different locations. Um, physically as well on the surface of the chip. Yeah, so that's, I guess, one thing. They Neurons are very small, you know, they're in the order of microns. So they will just grow into the, the silicon structures, kind of like you think of it like a like a plant, you know, growing around um, its scaffold, like a creeper kind of thing. So that's one thing. The second thing really is, I guess, this concept of what, what are these neurons doing, right? Mm -hmm. Why do they exist and what they're doing? And if you if you sort of take a reductionist point of view, these neurons are merely uh, information processing units, right? And what what information are they trying to look for? Now, if you look at the natural world, there are patterns everywhere, right? There are patterns in say time. So, you know, the sun rises and sets every twenty four seven. So that's a, that's one structure. We have things like phenomena like gravity, where if you drop something, it will fall and it will fall at a constant acceleration. So that's one thing. We see things such as natural natural order of things like lines, right? You know, trees, uh, landscapes, and so forth. So <clears throat> the natural world already has a lot of order. And what these neurons are trying to do is to model this natural order of, of things, right? Because if you think about it, the if you if you say uh, take a few steps back and say what what is the point of an organism? An organism needs to go find food. It needs to, you know, survive. It needs to then reproduce and pass on its genes to the next generation and so forth. Somewhere along the line, there's another organism that might want to eat it, right? And so then it has to evolve ways of understanding its environment, right? So the first thing is where's the food? How do I, you know, not fall off a cliff? That's the second thing to survive. And the third thing is, how do I make sure that the thing that's going to eat me isn't eating me before I reproduce? And so if if you take that approach of like the neurons actually trying to model the external world, then you can actually write a, som a, a software or a simulation of a, I guess, a made up uh, virtual world where you have this kind of order as well. So in this case of the work that we did, we built the very simple video game of Pong which itself has order and structure to it, right? You know, they're very, in the game of the one that we built, which is a single player breakout style, the only two rules, right, if you were to program it, which is have a ball, a ball will start with a random trajectory and it will continue on that vector trajectory until it hits either a uh, one of the three walls, um, or if it hits the other wall, that's, you know, the game is over, except for if it hits the paddle and then it will, you know, change its direction and so forth. So you already have these four or five rules which gives structure to the information that is being generated. Now, mm -hmm. if you feed this information into the neurons, based on the free energy principle that was developed by Professor Carl Fiston, which we're using uh, as the basis for our work, they should try to respond in a way that, that models and emulates this structured environment that we, we program in the computer. You showed this demonstration, right? Like you pretty yes. much live trained right uh, neurons yep. to play pong um in barcelona and that was such a cool cool experience i was wondering like um what key findings did did this produce and like generally i know in the presentation itself right you you kind of had that short demonstration but how long does it take to like train these neurons you know like you're feeding it like information or disorder mm -hmm. right you're creating disorder how long does that process take you know because it's a complicated process yeah so i mean the thing is that uh, you know we've done experiments and we've shown that within five minutes you can actually see a statistically significant difference in the return rate of the of the ball so you know this is in real time uh, and and i think the time is actually a really critical uh, aspect that is often forgotten about in, in artificial neural networks or deep learning training, right? Because time doesn't exist. You have your entire data set right there and then, right? That nothing is continuously evolving, how long it takes. And I think it makes sense, right? Because you and I, we operate at the same time scale as these neurons. You know, if uh, if somebody throws a ball at you, you, you're meant to catch it. You can't, <laughs> you know, 
wait for it to fly and go, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It's, oh, wait, I already missed it. It's on the ground there, right? So this is the key bit, which is that in the real world, we operate in this asynchronous fashion and we need to be able to, you know, have systems that, that operate at the same time scales. So I guess this question is more looking towards the future. I remember watching a YouTube video of someone programming an AI to play Pong as well. And one of the mm -hmm. major things was that he was using like a physics-based simulations that took too long. And so the AI would fail to return it because it was taking too long for it to calculate it. And so this yeah. kind of leads me into the question is, um, for him, he could just change models. But for you, you have neurons. How do you see like speed increases occurring? Like, can you add more neurons or change their architecture? Or what does that look like for your guys' development? So I think in terms of speed, they're already, they're already operating as fast as they can, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, the these things are operating in an analog fashion as opposed to digital. I think what we're talking about here is more about like bandwidth or, or complexity, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, how long does it take to train, say, something to play Doom or something that's more complex, like a grasping robot hand or, of sorts? I think it's a very hard question to, to sort of figure out. But certainly we know the fact that in the brain or at least with, say, um, <clears throat> complexities of organisms and the abilities that they have, the more three-dimensional, the richer the configuration of these neurons the faster they learn and the more skills that they acquire. So I think that's, that's a way to think about it as opposed to how much faster will it train. More so, what are the complexities of the skills at hand that it needs to master in going forward, right? So uh, that's the way I think about it. Because if you think about the neurons that we have in the dish, they're kind of no different than, say, a flattened cockroach on a that's been smeared out on a plate, right? I mean, if you mm -hmm. saw that playing Pong, you'd be pretty surprised as well. And, and we was, it was surprising for us too. But, you know, that, let's not kid ourselves. That's really what it is at the moment. It's a, you know, a flat cockroach, so to speak. Now, in order for us to probably get better performance, you know, we need to start thinking about how do we create more complex structures, right? How do we add hierarchy to it so that the entire layer is not doing all that computation, but some parts are being processed and hierarchies of abstractions are then created because that's that's essentially how the brain works i think one thing that you alluded to that maybe we could dive a little deeper into was uh for a computer model it's very easy to tell it right or wrong you give it a number and computers really like numbers for your yeah. neurons it's more difficult could you explain how you tell a neuron whether it's doing a good or bad job that was one of the hardest things, right? So you, traditionally in in most neuroscience um, fields, um, dopamine um, is usually regarded as the the reward mechanism of sorts. When we started, we didn't have enough funding to actually even have a system with dopamine, let alone have access to dopaminergic neurons. So it, it forced us to try and understand and try to think about it in more abstract information theoretic senses, right? So we said, well if the goal of these neurons is to get better at predicting their external world, would it mean that the, you know, making a false prediction or a bad prediction would be a, would be a bad thing and they should, they, they wouldn't want to be doing it. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Because, you know, if we, you and I had a very bad sense of the world, we'd feel very uncomfortable, right? For instance, if you saw, cup starting to float you'd be a i guess intrigued to begin with very you know intrigued <laughs> and you'd, you'd want to <laughs> investigate why that's the case you know perhaps maybe uh you know uh somebody's playing a, a prank on you with fishing wire of sorts but if you started doing that and you're like there's no fishing wire what what is this right this this there's a certain amount of unease because now your your model no longer fits your observation um, and so this is the thinking that we had could we use this sense of uh, what we call what, what in information theory is known as a surprise. Can we use inf the, the difference between information surprise of what's a, a predictable stimulus versus an unpredictable stimulus to as a way of rewarding or punishing or pushing a neuron down a, a, a good pathway versus a bad pathway? Can you go into what that what that looks like in more detail? Because to me, it seems like that punishment would be like random variation or, or random information, you know, to like confuse yeah. the neuron, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah. what kind of, I guess, yeah, what is that data or what what information are you getting sure. for reward and punishment? So yeah, let's just say, for instance, like, let's take an example. Let's say you have three stimulation sites, right? One, two, A, B, and C. A, a predictable stimulus might be saying, we'll stimulate A, then B, then C, at two, four, and six kilohertz, one after the other, right? And you do it over and over again. That's very predictable. 
you say it once, you say it twice. The third time you're like, okay, so I just saw B, what's C going to be? It's going to be six kilohertz kind of thing. And then what's after that? It's going to be A again. So that's a predictable stimulus. An unpredictable stimulus could be, well, what did I see at B? Could it be A the next one? I don't know. Because the last time wasn't A. Sorry, the last time wasn't A. It was it was B. Sorry, it was C. It could be B again. And then the 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 the, the stimulus wasn't two, it was it was a it was a four. So this is what we call the random information, right? We just randomly pick whatever schedule and we just stimulate it. So that way the neurons have no way of predicting which one would it be stimulating with. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah. So, so that's yeah, the, the regime that we use. And it turns out if you don't actually have this push and pull reward, punishment, reinforcement process, the neurons just don't bother to actually learn to play the game. They just move the paddle uh, almost as at baseline random chance. Yeah, it's quite interesting. I think that there might be videos out there. And so I highly suggest anyone to check them out. But it was very interesting watching the neurons actually change it. I guess... Yep. Throughout this conversation, you've alluded to uh, how we see the world a lot. And I think that kind of applies to your next application that potentially could be on the horizon, which is the application in personalized medical healthcare. Um, since you are using stem cells, we could create generalized versions of ourselves. And then, for example, use drugs and see the response of the brain cells. So almost like if we were drunk or if we uh, were impaired. Could you talk more about that and what other applications you see beyond just video games? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess, um, you know, it was a pleasant surprise for us when we, we did some work with induced human pluripotent stem cells. These are adult stem cells, not embryonic ones. Um, because we, we, we thought that, uh, you know, the, the mice neurons that we had started out with was going to be a better, they were going to perform better, right? Because if you, the way I, if you think about it, the way I would, would, would sort of describe it is equivalent to making soup. Uh, where the mice neurons is almost like opening a can of Campbell's soup. Everything is in there. You just got to put it in the, the stove and just stir it. And voila, within five minutes, you have soup and it's not, it's pretty tasty. On the other hand, when you do stem cells, it's very hard to know what the exact composition of, say, excitatory versus inhibitory neurons are going to be like. You don't know, you know, how much glia you need, what type of glia. And so a lot of it is guesswork. But, you know, to our surprise that even with this amount of guesswork, we actually got better performance with the human neurons, you know, which is, I guess, bragging rights that we are still at least smarter than a mouse. Uh, <laughs> and, and so... That opened up a very interesting channel for us because we were like looking at it going, well, if we're using human neurons, could we theoretically then also replicate the same genotype of the donor? And what mm -hmm. I mean by this is, let's say somebody had a mutation that made them acceptable to say epilepsy. So, you know, seizure form wave, uh, seizure waveforms, would we A, see it in, in the cells? The answer is yes. That's what, what that's what the current drug development protocol is like, right? We, we take uh, cells from donors with epilepsy, we grow them on the dish and we, we see that, that epileptic form sort of uh, activity happen. And then we test a whole bunch of drugs on it. Now, if you take a next step from there and you say, okay, now that we know that we can actually see seizure-like electrical activity from cells taken from donors with epilepsy, do we know if once we've squirted, a, say, a bunch of drugs on it and it drops the, the activity back to normal, whether they're still actually computing or, or cognitive back to normal, right? And prior to our work, nobody really knew. And honestly, we, we're not quite certain yet either. You know, this is, I guess subject to the next round of experiments and, and research that we have to do to prove that this is the case, which is, you know, are they actually performing their functional task, which is to compute and process information. And so assuming that this is the case, right, and we are able to actually prove this correlation that the, the Pong game is a pretty good analog to a cognitive task, but in a dish, then we theoretically now have an in vitro cognitive testing system which is extremely valuable because now we're able to, to observe the cognitive impairments that are in many conditions. So, you know, for instance, say dementia, right, which is a cognitive disease, probably the biggest and most important cognitive disease that we have to, 
look into. Parkinson's also has a cognitive component to it, you know, multiple sclerosis. And then, you know, of, of course, back to the epilepsy stuff as well. The, the cognitive impairment that comes from that is usually from side effects from the drugs, the anti-seizure drugs that we give, you know, things like sodium valparate, tegaderm, and, and, and all these things will, will actually cause a sort of brain fog side effect for, for a lot of patients. And that's actually the number one reason why patients discontinue from their anti-seizure medications. Now, this is not just limited to that, but things like antidepressants will also cause that, antipsychotics will, and literally anything that crosses the blood-brain barrier, we don't really know what the effects are. And, and this is particularly bad for people who, who are making new drugs because it's it could almost be that a side effect like you know poor cognitive functionality may be enough to, to sink a drug in development in a phase two clinical trial, which, you know, has lots of costs involved with it. And kind of the reason why we are still so slow in discovering new drugs to treat these, these conditions. So, you know, back to the, the, the question of like, what can we use this stuff for and what other applications, you know, I guess a personalized medicine. So I can actually in the future run a whole test, uh, a whole gamut of tests on these neurons that are genomically similar, similar to the ones in my head get the result and skip a whole bunch of drugs that A, either won't work or B, will cause a significant side effect so that I, I land in the one that's going to serve me best uh, with minimal amount of cost and, and disability. So that's one. And then the second one as well is, you know, if you now have a way of actually measuring cognition, could you theoretically now start building in vitro models of things like dementia? Could we have a dementia model in a dish? where we can then, instead of waiting for a pa patient to get dementia and then testing out drugs and having a whole bunch of compounding factors, right? Because it's very hard to actually test for this in, in the real world. Test it in a dish and then, you know, mm -hmm. brute force our way through all the compounds that, you know, we're discovering right now to find a candidate that could potentially cure these, 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 these diseases. And I think it's really important as well because, you know, back in Puzzle X and, and you know, a lot of these material science conferences, for instance, the the, the use of AI and quantum you know, one of the primary use cases that's been trumpeted for has been for the, for the biomedical side of things, the discovery of novel compounds, right, that can, you know, help cure diseases and so forth. The, the thing is, they are working. We have a ton of compounds and, and, and molecules coming out. The question is, with, you know, how, how do they actually work in the real world, right? Because it's one thing to generate all these molecules. We still need to somehow test them to make sure that they're safe and that there, are that there aren't any unintended side uh, effects from them. So I think this is where our system comes in and, and could be a, a, a sort of a, a major boost to, to innovation in the space. That led me to like another potential byproduct. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but just, just something that reminded me of is potentially like reducing um, the amount of, you know, animal, animal studies um, and, you know, all of the potential like ethical concerns with that. Is that correct? Or, um, yeah, because yeah, I know absolutely. that this is like brain related. So with the trials yeah. and everything like animal trials, maybe this could be a substitute for that. Yeah, absolutely. The FDA also recently just changed their position about this. And it, it actually was a bit of a, I think a major breakthrough um, in, in, in the drug development space, right? Because a, a, a animal testing is, is, is somewhat a little bit cruel, uh, but also expensive and laborious, right? If, if we can actually start building uh, in vitro models that a translate better and b are more, more scalable and 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 cheaper to to run, you know we should be doing this right because that means that the cost of drugs or the cost of development comes down, which eventually means that the the final price of them should also be coming down and be more accessible. Uh, b you know we don't have to go breed a whole bunch of mice and test them and see all these bad side effects and then put them down you know, in order to get a result. If we can do this without that, I think this is a major win for everybody on, on all sides. But then again, you know, <clears throat> the onus comes back to people like us to prove whether definitively or not that these models are so close to the real thing that we can almost use them as the substitute rather than, you know, you doing the animal testing, as you said. That's awesome. And then I had another question. You mentioned kind of how this like task for example, playing Pong could act as like an analog for, you know, basic cognitive tasks. Are there levels to those, those like cognitive ability that, you know, we now need to replicate? Um, I was just wondering kind of like from that standpoint, you know, there's maybe more complex cognitive tasks. So how do you try to simulate that? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff, right? I mean, Pong, I guess is, I get the first, the first step. And there's more really a proof of concept to say, look, there is a now non-zero probability that these things are actually doing some sort of computation. Before our work, it was 
uncertain, right? I mean, it's kind of easy to say, yeah, of course they are doing it now. And we're like, yes, that's because we did the, the ground, <laughs> groundwork to show that you could, right? This, there were 10,000 hours of data collected and, you know, we put it up there and, and now there's a paper. The question now becomes, well, how fast can you go? What do we need to do to improve that, that uh, capability? Mind you, as I said, like the system that we have is, is massively limited by the amount of stimulation that we can give it. Right. So we, we limited to, I think only like eight different stim sites and, you know, I think only three potentially varying different stimulation waveforms. Um, and so that's not a lot of, uh, variation or combinations that we can use to, 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 to feed information in. Um, I think it, the, the next steps really is to, a uh, come up with better input output sort of encoding schemes that is able to use time as a dimension right to 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 enrich the the input stream and then secondly developing new ways of, of doing this communication so that we're no longer limited by eight or, or three or eight but you know we can start scaling it up to uh you know twenties hundreds and maybe thousands and maybe even individual neuron stimulation i think is going to be um you know the next frontier Awesome. So I know we asked this question during Puzzle X, but um, I wanted to get your your thoughts here for our audience. I just yeah. wanted to hear, you've, you've talked about next steps, and I wanted to hear what is kind of that long-term vision that you have for Cortical Labs, and how do you want your technology to make an impact all around us? We've talked about the personalized medicine applications, but you know, long-term, what do you hope for, for Cortical, Cortical Labs to um, accomplish? Yeah, so I think it's it's you know uh, a really good question and and one that you know we've thought about a little bit recently, which is that we think that this space is 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 very new, but it's got a lot of potential to grow. Uh, mind you, silicon has had seventy years since Bob Noyce and and what they call them, the Traitorous Eight started out Fairchild Semiconductors, right? Actually, I guess it even goes back even further if you include um, Shockley Laboratories, right? Now <clears throat> the thing about it is that in those early days these chips were really used for very simple tasks like pocket calculators, perhaps they were probably used for miss missile trajectory systems and, and whatever, you know, that, that the defense side of things were, were willing to fund. Little did we think about the world that it is today, right? If you ask anybody in the fifties, I guess there were a few sci few sci-fi writers who would talk about this, you know, futuristic world where we're all connected and having all these like, you know, magical devices in our pockets. <clears throat> it took a while for it to get there. Um, but what, happened along the way was that the technology got more accessible a became cheaper tooling around it to write software became um, easier um, and more accessible as well to to a broader range of people and from there you know you had people like mark zuckerberg in his dorm room like building a social network that is you know possibly the most one of the most powerful tech companies on the planet um all of this didn't happen magically out of thin air it was built on the backs of many, many years of computer science research funded mostly by the government, I guess. And and what happened along the way was that companies were, and I think it's changed a little bit in the last 20 years or so, were very happy to build platforms and stick in their lanes and say, look, you know, we're going to make a chip, but we're going to put it out there so anyone can use it and they can build stuff on top of it. And I think this is the the correct model, especially when you're, when you're starting a new space which is you want to encourage people who have background contextual experience in in different fields to come in and use the technology rather than try to encroach on it right because um, a collaborative way i think is a better use of resources to sort of expand it out and so the whole goal and, and hope for the company really is to be like the early days of the silicon players and say look you know we're going to actually be focusing on what we do best which is growing these neurons building interfaces and trying to and come up with theoretical ways of how these things work. Um, but we really want more people to come on board and start developing on top of it for whatever applications. And we see this happening right now with chat GBT, right? The, the, the thing that's so interesting to observe people talk about it on places like Twitter and LinkedIn is like, Oh, well, you know, Google already had this with Lambda or, or yes, you know, at meta, we already have all these things. Yes, they did. But the difference between what they had and what OpenAI has done with ChatGPT has been a simple thing, which is the interface, where previously, if you wanted to build a large language model and use it, you needed 
to hey know how to use linux b spin up a pytorch or tensorflow instance load a model train some data and you know so on and so forth with chat gpt it was a simple web interface you just type whatever you wanted and out you came and there was a little api that let you did do that and that has caused the imagination of all these developers out there to just explode right now we're having people going hey look i did this to write my you know uh wedding thank you cards and notes and so forth right and oh somebody started a business that you know will do whatever i don't know jokes or whatever kind of thing around it and and i think that is i think the the, the most important part which is um how do you make the technology you've developed accessible the the barrier to entry is much lower uh, than what the status quo is. And I think this is something that we have to continuously work on, given that, you know, we're coming from such a deep, complicated uh, field like, you know, systems neuroscience and, and, and theoretical artificial intelligence and, and cognitive neuroscience. Yeah, one of my colleagues re uh, recently said that uh, chat, like AI in general will have like the biggest effect on knowledge-based jobs first because mm. it's an AI that's like you, but it has all your knowledge and can access it instantly. And so yeah. you you see in the news all the time, it's like passing all these exams. And so I think that just like the calculator, it will be a tool to be used to help us. Um, and it'll just like before calculators, I'm sure everything had to be done by hand. And before AutoCAD, my professor would constantly say like, oh, we just put a big drawing on the ground and we had lights and we just drew all over it. And so I think it could be seen as another drop in the bucket in this instance. But oh, I, yeah, guess, sure. yep. I guess a question I have for you is that you sit at a very interesting intersection between these artificial intelligence that's growing and now you're adding in biological intelligence. Um, since we are an MSC focused podcast, are there any materials science innovations that would help you boost performance or you have an eye on? And then just any advice you have for grads who want to get into basically a field that may not exist, like you kind of started with cortical labs. There's a whole bunch of things that, you know, that material science will actually help with this field, right? And it's with anything, but any new material usually has some sort of world changing like end result. The question is, you know, finding the right people to, to do it. Like, what was it? A uh, uh, Velcro, right? Like, yeah, you know, NASA developed it, but what it really did change the garment industry, right? Mm -hmm. People were like, wait, we don't need buttons anymore. Great, right? And so, uh, but then again, you know, if you give it to like automakers and stuff, they'd be like, well, I don't know about Velcro. We we have other things <laughs> that can do with it. Right? It's about finding finding the the right people. Right fit. The right fit exactly um you know some of the things that you know come to mind are like you know gra graphene right very uh really good conductance very thin um right you know what are they like actual one one nanometer mm -hmm. sort of uh width right because they're just carbon atom uh flash of carbon those things would be really useful as well if we could actually grow neurons on top of that and excuse me uh read and stimulate them using things like graphene things like um scaffolds right so there's a lot of research going on into scaffolds at the moment because <clears throat> one of the areas of, of of significant interest in the stem cell development space are these things called organoids so they're essentially three-dimensional clumps of of these stem cells that have structure that somewhat resemble the the, the larger organs that you know the these cells were taken from so for instance people have started to grow kidney organoids that actually look like kidneys and start you know filtering them or heart and cardiac organoids that you know somehow also start to spontaneously beat the hard thing about doing these organoids um, is however that the larger that they get and because these are three-dimensional structures the less sophisticated to volume ratio they have which means that the diffusion process gets worse uh, the larger they, they, they get, particularly to the, the central core part of these organoids. And oftentimes, there are labs that purport that they can grow very large ones. Like, you know, we've had people say, yes, we can grow like half a gram worth of organoids. And we're like, yes, sure, let's put it on the system and see what they're doing. And you find out that the vast majority of the, organ, the organoid inside are just dead cells. Um, mm -hmm. They look big, but nothing is happening inside because, you know, they've all been suffocated. So things like scaffolds, you know, are probably going to be key to actually allowing the diffusion process to still penetrate into these three-dimensional structures. A whole bunch of other spaces such as, you know, uh, protein uh, capsoids and stuff like that can be used for vector uh, delivery of uh, sort of viral vectors. 
you, you name it. There's a whole bunch of stuff, right? But I think it's uh, uh, an area that we're, we're watching closely, but it's not our core competency. So hopefully we'll be able to collaborate with people who, who have made progress in this space. Absolutely. Awesome. And so we definitely appreciate your time. This is such a fun topic to discuss. And we were just wondering if you could wrap wrap this up with your piece of advice for like the next generation of scientists, maybe current students who want to make that impact at the frontier of, you know, artificial yep. intelligence, biological intelligence, or material science. Yeah. So I think it's important to keep an open mind, right? And and I can't remember which lecturer once had said a very good thing, which was that, you know, sometimes what you got to do is not plant your tree in a forest but plant a new forest right so you know don't follow the trends of going oh well this is what everyone's doing i'm going to do it as well it's uh it's it's sometimes better to take a few steps back and go okay well everyone's doing this but is anyone doing what i'm doing do i have any conviction and passion of, of that this is going to be a thing and keep working on it right because a lot of the times people won't actually appreciate or understand what you're doing and that's okay right because you know these things are rare right they don't happen all the time but you know um, they do happen and and it's important to not give up um and and really believe in what you do right so and and you know try to keep on that path because i've seen so many people you know, work on very interesting projects um, only for them to give up because something new and shiny came along and they got a lot of attention and, you know, everyone just started to shift across to it, right? Which is what happens a lot, unfortunately, in science and academia where people, you know, now get whiff of, oh, large language models are doing this. They drop everything they do and they all start doing like that that same thing because that's where the funding is at. Uh, but if you do this, then you are in a, you end up getting into a crowded pool. Uh, whereas what you really want to do is, is do the blue ocean strategy, right? Which is, you know, you may be swimming in a, in a, in a uh, by yourself in a large ocean and you may not see any fish, but the, the moment you see the fish, there is no one else in that space and you get all that fish to yourself, as opposed to jumping into the smaller pool where you can see the fish, but there are also all the other people around that space that, you know, are competing against. So yeah, the the advice I have is really just you know, if you if you really believe in what you have what you have, um, stick with it, right? It it will be hard, and sometimes you may question yourself, why am I doing this when I could be doing the the popular thing? Uh, but I think it's important that you know people keep doing what they're doing, well, as, as long as the science is valid, because that's what we need in science, right? Which is this this plurality of ideas, this contest of ideas. You know, we should, we should be having lots of them. And then determining the one that succeeds based on observation and success rather than everyone, you know, following trends, because that's no longer science that becomes more uh, religion, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Just giving it time, you know, and I really appreciate that advice and I appreciate your time, Han. This was really yeah. great. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, guys. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry. But with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role in company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who have been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.